Welcome to the History and Nerds United podcast. I am your head nerd, Brendan. Thank you so much for being here. Today, author Mark Galliotti wrote Putin's Wars. He is also a world-renowned expert on Russia, Putin, a lot of other stuff. We talk about the Ukraine war. We talk about drinking vodka, wide-ranging conversation. It was fantastic. I can't wait for you to hear it because he knows this stuff just every which way. So I'm going to shut up so we can get to the expert. Let's bring Mark on. All right, and here we are, author of Putin's Wars from Chechnya to Ukraine, Mark Galliotti. Mark, thanks so much for coming on. That was my pleasure. Now, listen, Mark, you're not just a one-hit wonder, but I do want to point out that something happens in Russia. Everyone goes, call Mark. He knows what's going on. What's it like being seen as a world expert on something? Or if I was going to ask the question a different way, no one in my life listens to me. What do I have to do so they'll listen to me like the world listens to you? Can you give me like a three-step process for it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, the first of all, do it for decades. Secondly, sound plausible. And three, just get, get lucky. I mean, look, this business of, of, of being a world, world expert and so forth, you know, look, nowadays we are all entrepreneurs of our own narrative and our own image, whether it's our Twitter feeds or, or whatever else. And, you know, that's fair enough. But on the other hand, I think we also have to recognize that there's no doubt going to be some people out there who, who, who regard me as just simply a villainous charlatan. And indeed, it's worth noting that as far as the Russian government is concerned, when, when they barred me indefinitely from entry last June, it was as a, an enemy of the Russian state and, and the Russian people. Certainly, I think in this kind of very voracious media age, there is something quite extraordinary about sometimes when, when things happen, particularly if they're you know, really squarely within my own areas of interest, which are in this sort of strange triangulation of Russian politics, criminality and security, which in some ways are pretty much all the same. But there are subtle differences between the three. And then suddenly, yeah, my phone is just constantly ringing. And it's everyone from, you know, some heavyweight out outfit to BBC Bristol. And I have nothing against BBC Bristol. So I'm ne definitely not having a go at them. But it's just interesting that, that that point where, you know, everyone wants to sort of take a small piece of you. And my email queue is is, is full of someone from, again, country of, of, of choice, wanting just half an hour of your time. And I'm thinking, well, look, I've got only 24 hours a day like everyone else. And I also, you know, have a life and a family and, and occasionally I even like to sleep. So, look, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not complaining. It's, it, it, it's the life I built for myself. But it is quite extraordinary sometimes when you suddenly realize just how global everything has become. Now, does it hurt? You've mentioned it yourself, and I wanted to ask about this. Does it hurt that you can't take a quick holiday to Moscow, see the Kremlin? Or is it just a pure point of pride that Putin's like, that guy can't come in here? Yeah, I mean, listen, that, that's, you know, if, if I had any real marketing now, that's exactly how I'd be selling myself. Mark Galliotti, the man Putin fears. I wish it were that straightforward. I'm sure it was just some overworked foreign ministry staffer who was told, draw up a list of whatever it was, 26 or whatever snotty Brits who've been saying bad things about us and we'll ban them. Yeah, it, it does hurt. It does hurt because, and in some ways, this is a really heretical thing to say these days. But uh, I, I really like Russia. And indeed, I like most Russians. And in that respect, I think that one can reconcile that with also being horrified and opposed to the war that's going on. Because I think most Russians, frankly, we should think of them more as Putin's hostages than his supporters these days. But it's also the fact of not, not just that, yes, it's, it's, it's nice to walk through Red Square and see the Kremlin, but it's also because from a research point of view, there are conversations that you just can't have unless you are frankly saying face to face, ideally with that crucial, if unacknowledged, research tool, alcohol added into the mix, or the, the times you're sitting in the metro or on a train journey and you're shamelessly eavesdropping on the conversations around you. Now, look, I mean, of, of the contacts I've got in, in, in Russia, I would say about a third have absolutely dropped me since I was banned. And I don't blame them in the least. I mean, this is a regime which is moving from authoritarianism to totalitarianism, and people have to think of themselves and their families and such like. And then there are others who you might say we, we, we can talk, but in very constrained circumstances. One guy, for example, he, he travels for business a lot. So he's often in places like Istanbul and Dubai. When he's out the country, he's happy for us to talk, but not inside the country. So, you know, 
these these things you you work themselves out. But look, I I am a well, I was going to say an aged veteran uh, of 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 being a sort of a Russian studies person. My PhD was in the dog days of the Soviet Union, 1988 to 91. We've seen easy times. We've seen tougher times. None, I would say, as tough as this really since Soviet times. But still, these things pass and one still makes connections. And as far as I'm concerned, I will be going back to Russia. All I have to do is outlive Vladimir Putin. Fingers crossed. Absolutely. I have high hopes. (laughs) Well, this is a thing, too, especially when it comes to uh, vodka, I will say that I took Russian in college. I remember approximately four words, and I think I can say them pretty well. But when you are an expert on something, especially something like Russia, you are going to drink vodka. It is required. Is there also a pressure to that, though, right? Because you have a few drinks on the weekend and you decide to say out loud, oh, yeah, you know, Putin eats glue on the weekends. That could end up somewhere as, you know, expert says this on the weekends. Is that a pressure that you have? You're kind of like, ah, we'll see what happens. I mean, the thing is, I can't stand vodka. And to a large extent, that's because of New Year's Eve 1984 in Moscow. I have never been so drunk in my entire life and so ill. And since that point, I mean, anyway, I'm not really a spirits person. But of course, that, that was a real problem. I mean, you know, if I think back to even when I was doing my, my research, I, my PhD topic was the impact of the Soviet-Afghan war on the Soviet Union. So I was doing a lot of work with veterans. And again, exactly, you know, very much it would be the sort of the toasts and the vodka and all the sort of traditions. And there was no way on God's good earth that I was going to try and keep up with Russians on alcohol consumption. So in, in some ways, I almost had to make a feature of a bug and just present myself as, he, look, I am this weak Western academic. There's no way I'm going to try and sort of keep up with paratroopers shot for shot. Yeah, look, one has to be sort of cautious. And look, it's not that I'm trying to drink people under the table. It's more that just it's the alcohol, but it's also the environment. There's one thing about when you're sort of having an interview. When you're actually, you know, in a bar or, you know, in, in someone's home and there's, you know, an open bottle or there's a beer or whatever, it's just much more conducive to a kind of a free flowing conversation. So this is the thing. It's, it, you know, it will be in a, both inappropriate as well as unwise to actually try and get people drunk enough that they'll say things they don't want to say. It's more that it's just a little mild social lubricant. Well, let's talk about Putin's wars. And I think we need to add another title to the you know, a thousand you already have, which is uh, Nostradamus. (laughs) So I read Putin's Wars, right? And for those of you who have not seen it, it's not just, oh, I'm going to tell you about Putin. It's about really how the Russian military got to where it got to today. And you did the bulk of it basically before Ukraine happened, and then you added a little piece. Mm -hmm. But as I'm reading this book, I'm going, holy crap, he wrote a book about how Ukraine was going to go before it happened. And then it happened in real time. So that's why I say Nostradamus. I'm like, there's no way he rewrote the book to make it look like this. Did you feel unfortunately validated? Because what is happening in Ukraine is atrocious. Is there also kind of the validation of, hey, this is how it's going to go. And then you see it happening in real time. I mean, there is an element of that. Look, there's no way of getting around this this deep discomfort when, in effect, Vladimir Putin is your media and marketing executive. Because precisely, he has made all this talk about the Russian military that much more central to the kind of discussions we're all having all all the time. I mean, the irony is this, that precisely because such a central theme of the book had been the degree to which the Russian military looks really good goose-stepping through Red Square, but in fact still had deep, deep systemic weaknesses, was actually why I did not think, until about a week before, that Putin actually would invade. I thought it was 30 to 40 percent likely. And the reason was that it didn't make sense. And this has been a case study in how rational actors, and Putin is a rational actor. I mean, he's not just simply barking mad. He believes a lot of barking mad things. But it's proof that a rational actor can do deeply stupid things if they believe foolish things or if people are telling them stuff which is not accurate. And in a way, I had overstated the degree to which Putin actually had a handle on what was happening with his own military. And I'd also over, overestimated the courage of his own generals. Because you'd think at one point, someone would have said, look, Vladimir Vladimirovich, 
it's not going to be quite that easy. But, you know, everyone just waited for someone else falling on on, on their sword. So, yeah, I mean, this is it. I, I mean, I hesitate to say you know, Putin should have read my book first. But certainly everyone's lives would have been a lot better if he had. Because I think this is the thing. It, it really showed the degree to which processes which, yeah, which is, you know, what the book's about, which is on the one hand, Putin is obsessed with and fascinated by war fighting power. And he regards that as the absolutely central thing to any kind of nation that wants to call itself a great power. It's none of this hippie, soft power type stuff. No, no. It's about basically the the capacity to force other countries to do what you want, regardless of whether they want to. Despite the fact that he's got this this you know, obsession, which you know, meant that for 20 plus years, he has been dumping money onto his military to buy all, all the shiny new kit and so forth. But the point is because he didn't understand the military, that he wasted so much of that. I'm somebody who was in the military. Um, I don't come necessarily from a military family, but, you know, my father was in Vietnam. So, you know, I was aware of things, especially late 80s, early 90s. I'm starting to, you know, read more things and understand all these things. And if you're a kid from around the 80s, the answer is the commies are bad. And if we get into a war, it's World War III. And it's, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be nuts. And what I read from the book as you kind of walk it through is the overall takeaway is that Russia has all these resources. But for many years, they don't seem to learn institutionally lessons that they should learn, especially logistics. They still have not figured that part out. Mm-hmm. And how close am I? am I? Did I take the right stuff or did I miss it completely? Yeah, I mean, because I, I, I throw in one, you know, it's, again, it's always worth noting that although there's a limit to how much one can play the GDP comparison game, the gross domestic product. But, you know, essentially Russia, it's this huge country. It's got a population of more than 140 million people. It's also got a GDP somewhere between that of Italy and Spain. I say this with love as a half Italian myself, but I don't think anyone is saying, well, Let's face it, no global issue can be resolved without Rome being on board. And I think this is the problem. It's also, I mean, you're absolutely right about logistics. And again, it's this kind of, it's the boring back end stuff. You know, Putin is a man who can't walk past a tank or a jet without a photo opportunity in the cockpit. But the boring stuff of just making sure people have, you know, that your soldiers have hot meals and there's enough ammunition where they need to be and all that kind of stuff. That's not fun. That's not exciting. So he wasn't interested. So on the one hand, he didn't understand logistics. But on the other hand, he also didn't understand economics. In terms of just simply the fundamental limitations. Yes, sure, you can't do a straightforward ruble to dollar comparison or whatever. I mean, this is something that I find often because, bizarrely enough, for most of the period, Russia's defense budget, if you convert it into pounds, is pretty much equivalent to the British defense budget. And more than once, I have had, you know, bemused officer cadets and so forth asking me, how can Russia maintain a million man army with the same budget we have? Well, of course, it's, it's, it's not the same because the Russians are not buying foreign weapons. They're not buying their food abroad or whatever. But still, when it comes down to it, this is not the Soviet Union. And another thing that you just mentioned, this comes up very early in the book, I think like page 28. Putin was never in the military. He's taking these pictures and he's making this, as you said, this is what he's projecting, this military might and this everything, but he was never in the military. And it makes him seem honestly almost comical when you see how much he's leaning into something that he didn't actually do himself. How do people in Russia look at that? Is it just, is this an autocrat doing what autocrats do, right? Like they they make sure the military loves them because that way they can keep power. Or is there part of Russia that kind of realizes it's a bit ridiculous? I mean, this, I think there's a really stark divide between the professional soldiers and everyone else. And on the whole, everyone else, uh, you know, they kind of, again, in, you know, internalize this thing. You see a guy constantly up there and wearing camouflage, looking through binoculars at a military exercise or whatever, and you sort of just assume that he must know what he's talking about or what he's looking at. The professional soldiers, I, I mean, it was interesting. And again, these are the kind of conversations that I'll miss because you have to get beyond the initial suspicion about, you know, what is this Westerner wanting wanting to learn from me. But, you know, I remember talking to professional soldiers. And then there's exactly this one specific example in in the book when I talk about these guys who at first, they give the standard line that, you know, Putin is amazing. He's here to sort of basically save Russia. Everything is great. But then once you talk for longer, it becomes clear that there is a certain discomfort and almost a sense of resentment that he uses the military really as a prop for his, his PR. And a concern that he doesn't necessarily truly understand it. And there was this this line about the fact that, you know, Basically, as one said, I don't think I'd want a virgin advising me what to do on my wedding night. 
Look, he did his bare minimum reserve officer training when he was at university in the 1970s. And look, everyone I've spoken to who, who, who went through that, if they weren't planning a military career, it means you, you snooze through a few obligatory lectures given by some veteran of the Great Patriotic War, the Second World War. Maybe you spend a couple of weekends in the summer you know, living, living in a tent and doing drill. But basically, that's that. You, know, you, don't, you don't actually learn anything. And he could have stayed in the reserve, but as soon as he left and joined the KGB, he used that to basically have him yanked out of the reserve so that he wouldn't have to do his refresher training. So, you know, he certainly wasn't at all interested in putting his own time and effort into learning about the military. So perhaps it's no wonder that actually the professional soldiers, even before this disastrous war, did have their suspicions. Is the way that Russian succession has worked since the fall of the USSR. Was Putin kind of inevitable out of this system with all the things that we're talking about and each of the people along the way? Is Putin just another line of kind of the same guy? Or are we looking at something a bit new as far as Russia is concerned? I think we're looking at something quite specific. And look, nothing is ever inevitable, except, you know, in hindsight, we always say, well, it was inevitable. But of course, there's so many contingencies. And to a degree, I've got to be honest, I think in the West, we messed up royally in the 1990s. End of the Cold War, we thought, oh, thank God for that. We don't really have to worry about Russia anymore. We can just basically ignore it. It's currently a bit of a basket case. Its economy is in free fall. Its politics, you know, no one knows what the hell's going on. The mafia seems to run everything. Ah, never mind. And actually, we probably helped create this sort of backlash that meant some kind of a nationalist leader was going to arise. It didn't necessarily mean Putin, but someone a bit like Putin was much, much more likely. Because, you know, who comes up on the basis of people thinking, look, the West are clearly sanctimonious hypocrites. They say they're in favor of democracy, but in practice, they're fine with Boris Yeltsin, the, the 1990s president, shelling his own parliament into submission in defiance of the constitution. But, you know, uh, whatever. But then, I mean, actually, once Putin's in power, Putin evolves over time, not necessarily in good ways, but he changes. And sometimes we handle him well and often we handle him badly. But I mean, I think a key thing about Putin is to appreciate that he is a product of a particular generation. He is this kind of the last of the homo sovieticus, the Soviet man. People who basically didn't just go through a Soviet era education system, but also had their early formative career experiences in the Soviet system. And in his case, it was the KGB. Now, he didn't join the secret police because he wanted to be the sword and shield of the Communist Party. He joined it because basically it was the biggest gang in town. It was, you know, the route to power and security and stability. And he, like so many of the people around him, was of a kind of a first in their family to really break into the big time, to join the Communist Party, to join the elite. They thought they had it made. And then suddenly the system collapses around them. And it's clear that, you know, it's not only that they've got all the kind of imperial pretensions of the Soviet times, they've also got this embittered sense that we had something stolen from us and who took it from us. There's a real emotional edge, I think, to Putin and, and the people around him who are all between 68 and 74 years old, almost all of them are ex-KGB backgrounds. We often ignore the role of emotion in geopolitics. We look at sort of grand strategy and historical process. I think it's also that just these are people who just think the West screwed us over and you don't get to do that and we're going to screw you back. In some ways, that's a terrible thing for us to be dealing with. But on the other hand, I think it's good because it's, I think it is quite limited to that generation. And in due course, Putin and co, they're going to be toppled, they're going to die, whatever. And there's going to be a new political generation that I think is quite different, not necessarily nicer. But these are ruthless, pragmatic kleptocrats. They want to be able to steal at home and then spend it abroad. What's the point in, spend, in, in stealing on an industrial scale if you can't moor your yacht off the coast of France and send your mistress shopping for clothes in Milan and buy your nice penthouse in London and send your kids to a university in America? You know, for them, this war, this confrontation with the West is really bad for business. And so, look, these are not Democrats. As I said, these are certainly not nice people. But I think the next political generation of people we're going, to, we're going to be dealing with, and we can deal with, because we deal with kleptocrats all the way around the world, all the time. The book for me, as I'm reading it, is, going back to kind of what I mentioned before, is there's this lack of lessons learned, it seems, and it very much focused on the military as you are within the book, that they keep missing the point. And especially with, and we can kind of transition to Ukraine, where I know when it started, I'm like, well, it's Russia. Russia is just going to roll right over them. 
I was finishing your book probably about two weeks after I remember seeing the picture of the long convoy on the side of the mountain on that one road. And I'm like, I was not, a, you know, a super advanced army officer or everything, but I'm sitting there going, that's bad. You never, never do that. And I'm like, why is the Russian military having such a hard time? Like, go Ukraine. But as I'm reading your book, I'm like, oh, it's also this military is not ready to do what we consider a lot of the other bigger militaries to do, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two points worth making there. I mean, one of them is in terms of military reform. Look, military reform had been m moving on, and it had made some progress, it has to be said. It's not, it hadn't been completely useless. But the point is, it very much was focused on the, the elite forces, the Spetsnaz special forces, the paratroopers, the naval infantry, in other words, the marines. And that was fine up to the point of this war. It was fine because up to now, Russia had basically always picked small wars. It was fighting a, a sort of a counter guerrilla war in, in Chechnya, horrendous and brutal, but, you know, a small portion of the Russian Federation. It was fighting a war with, with, with Georgia, again, a, a relative fly speck of a country compared with Russia. It was taking Crimea at a time, and let's face it, that was a pretty much textbook special forces operation in 2014. But it was a time when basically the Ukrainian state was had collapsed, so there was basically no one really to resist. And then it was deploying forces into Syria from 2015 onwards, which was largely a sort of small footprint, air power and a little bit of special forces on the ground and some mercenaries to do the heavy lifting. But again, you know, all these were, were limited controlled operations where the Russians could actually send their best. And on the whole, they often were, I mean, not, not so much in Georgia, but certainly if one looks at Crimea or, or Syria, actually it was much better than we were anticipating in the West. But the trouble is, again, you know, in terms of Putin's misunderstanding, I think rather than thinking, ha, huh, OK, so our best can do pretty good stuff. Putin kind of extrapolated from that and assumed that just because a relative handful of special forces operators can do X, somehow the entire 850,000 strong Russian military can do X too. And it's not like that. I mean, look, all armies have a certain gradient between the most special special forces down to the not so special forces. But in Russia, that's a very long, very steep gradient down from, you know, all professional special forces units to kind of co half conscript grunt units that maybe, you know, actually have got the kind of the dregs of the officers and, and, and everything else. So, I mean, he didn't understand that. So he just thought he could just kind of magically scale up and you could, you could take something that worked in Crimea and apply it to a country with more than 40 million people, which has been planning for eight years for this very war and planning very, very well. So that's kind of point one. But point two is also, it would be a little perverse to say that I feel sorry for the Russian officer corps, given the, the, the atrocities that they're, they're carrying out. But this is not the war the way the officer corps would have fought it. Again, I mean, this is really a, a result of what happens when you have an autocrat in charge and no one can tell him no. The Russians have this very, very intellectual approach to war. They have they, they classify wars in different ways and they have a whole structure. And they are aware of a lot of their own flaws, indiscipline, corruption, inefficiencies and such like. And they try and have systems to get their way around it. The point is Putin decided that, you know, again, he was presumably this, this brilliant military genius or something. And he and his friends, a whole bunch of, you know, superannuated spooks could plan this war. And basically springing on his own generals, in some cases, just with a couple of days' notice. I mean, there is, there's one very specific example. There's, there's, there's a, again, I'm not, not going to go into deep military wonkery, but there is a structure within the Russian National Defense Management Center called a combat management group that is meant to, that you set it up well in advance, and it just ensures that, you know, there's, there's a clear plan and a clear chain of command, and everyone knows what they're doing, and there's the material that's there. It, it's the sort of the, the, the super logistics and, and, and planning sort of body. Now, for a big war, this should be set up about six months in advance. As near as I can tell, it was set up the week of the invasion. So, you know, the body that's meant to actually ensure the invasion works wasn't even really standing by the time that, you know, when it started. So, I think, again, this is a case of basically the, the Russian military ended up kind of forced into sort of this amateurish type of war that wasn't going to work. And it meant that all their best troops, well, a large portion of their best troops, got hammered in the first days and weeks of the war. And so ever since then, the Russians have been dealing, you know, basically having to deploy the B, C and D list units because Putin basically burned through the A list ones.
I don't want to sound overly simplistic because there's a lot of differences, but it echoes a lot of Stalin, which is, hey, we're not doing great. Throw more people at it then. Just keep pouring in the people. It's almost like Putin kind of thinks the way Stalin did, which is, I can solve this because I have just people that I can use for cannon fodder for days. And that's often what it feels like, not, hey, we need better logistics, we need better planning, we need better this, we need better than that. The answer is, just keep throwing stuff at it, sooner or later we'll win because we're Russia. Yeah, but the interesting thing is this. First of all, actually, Stalin learned lessons. I mean, again, I mean, one of the reasons why the Russians, the Soviets rather, were so totally unprepared for the initial Nazi hammer blow is because Stalin was certain that he had essentially ensured that there would be one more winter's worth of preparation. And so when even his own soldiers were saying, look, you know, we have defectors coming across the line saying they're attacking tomorrow, Stalin refused to believe them because he thought, well, actually, he thought it was the Brits. We are the source of all Russia's evils, it's worth noting, you know, that actually were, were, were trying to basically instigate a, a war between the Soviet Union and, and, and Germany. And then when it happened, and so much of the Soviet military was, was, was just destroyed in the early days and hours of the war even, you know, yeah, the majority of the Soviet air force was destroyed on the ground. Stalin seems to have almost had a nervous breakdown of some kind. But when he came out of that, he clearly learned the lesson. He stepped back from trying to actually run the war. He let the generals do the generaling. He would set broad strategy and ensure that the sort of the national effort was devoted. But, you know, the Zhukovs and the Konyevs and these other brutal but brilliant generals that the Soviet Union had were allowed to do their thing. That's the first thing. Second point is Stalin could do that. He could use his own people like ammunition. Because, first of all, they genuinely were fighting an existential struggle. You know, they were fighting after all. You know, the Nazis, what was their vision for the Soviet Union? Basically, that on the whole, the, the Slavs would be either killed or turned into sort of illiterate slaves of a whole new class of Aryan colonists. This really was a, a war in which the Soviets had to survive. But secondly, you had this massive secret police machine. It's a lot easier to decide to stand and fight if the alternative is the secret police putting a bullet in the back of your head. Putin does not have that kind of, oh, thank God, that kind of political machine. He doesn't have that kind of terror machine. And if anything, Putin's actually having to be very cautious. I mean, he's not sending conscripts at the moment. He's got 180,000 conscripts who are actually better trained and equipped than a lot of the soldiers being deployed. But because he knows there'd be a massive political outcry if he sent them in, he's not. He's not mobilizing the sort of numbers he could precisely because he's worried about his own people. I mean, we should be very pleased about this, that again, all Putin can really be is Stalin in light. And that's very interesting because I remember when uh, the Ukraine war started, when I saw on TV all of those Russians in the street and the sheer number, I said to myself, I'm like, that's interesting. First of all, that couldn't have happened 30, 40 years ago. They would have all disappeared. But I was reading your blog in Moscow Shadow, also a wonderful podcast. Listen to it. And you just put out an entry that right now, 70% of the Russian population is, for lack of a better term, right? There's a lot of words within it, but 70% are behind continuing the war in Ukraine. How do we interpret that, right? Because when this started, it looked like a good chunk of Russia was saying, this should not be happening. This is terrible. And now it almost looks like, well, we're here, so let's keep going then. Well, you see, this thing is, I'm actually going to push back against that statistic. That just simply is a post that reports the outcomes of a, a discussion. I personally don't buy that 70% figure. Or rather, what we have is it seems to be fairly clear that there's about 25 to 30% of Russians who are actively opposed to the war. I mean, they're not all coming out in the streets because, frankly, yeah, I mean, you have to be incredibly brave to do that. Tens of thousands did, and tens of thousands got arrested, beaten, fined, or sent to prison. I'm not convinced that I'd be heroic enough to, to go out there and do that when you pretty much know it's guaranteed that you'll be arrested. There are many who are not willing to go out in the streets, but are still very much opposed to the war. So, and then we've got that 70% figure. Now, for some people, therefore, they interpret, well, if they're not in the group that's opposed to the war, they're in favor of the war. I don't think that's true. I think there's only about 20, 25% of Russians who are actively supportive of the war. The 50 or so percent in the middle, and this is a very, very Soviet thing, are desperately trying not to have an opinion. They're keeping their heads down. They're not watching the news. I mean, it's amazing, actually, uh, viewing figures for the news and these very, very overheated kind of geopolitical talk shows that you get on Russian television. Viewing figures are plummeted 
because basically it's it's equivalent to just sticking your fingers in your ears, hoping you know, and just hoping that everything bad will go away. Because you're not, you don't know exactly what to believe. You know what the government tells you, but you know the government lies to you. You don't know if they're lying to you on this one, and you don't want to think about that too much because if you do think about it, then you might actually have to do something about it. It's so reminiscent that I found when I was doing my PhD about how so many Soviets viewed the war in Afghanistan. There was no great enthusiasm for it. But on the other hand, there was that sense of, look, it's nothing I can do. So why have an opinion at all? It's a difficult thing for us to get our heads around in democracies because, you know, however imperfect, we always know there is something we can do in a democratic system and to do it safely. That is not the experience of Russians. And one of the really depressing things for me has been how much these sort of almost Soviet attitudes have bubbled up in these times. It's not safe to have an opinion, so I'm not going to have an opinion. So most Russians, they certainly are not supportive of the war. They're just not quite yet willing to be opposed to it. Now, you are an expert, so I wanted to ask something. My producer, Mike, sometimes reads dodgy journalism. And one of the conversations we had before this interview is I was reading something about how China is kind of propping Russia up or ready to support and everything. And my feeling on this, if I could make a very, very novice metaphor here, China is kind of like Russia and China are at a party together. Russia is getting a little belligerent, a little bit drunk. China knows them. They're friends. They're not best friends. And China's kind of sitting there going, I don't know what I'm going to do. If this turns into a brawl, do I let him get his ass kicked or do I have to jump in here? So... As childish as that sounds, how close is my metaphor, do you think, the relations between China and Russia are right now? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that that works. I mean, particularly from China's point of view, that at first they were really uncomfortable when this war started, not least because they had a load of investments in Ukraine. Ukraine was China's biggest uh, import market of corn, for example. And all of a sudden, you know, as you can imagine, the fields are not being harvested because everyone was shelling them. But on the other hand, I think now the Chinese have thought, well, look, actually, in some ways, this is win-win for us. We sit back. We don't really help the Russians because, frankly, you know, this is their own stupid war. We make it clear one thing that is don't use nukes because we really don't want to see that uh, taboo broken. Not because we're nice people, but because if and when we want to go after Taiwan, we don't want to think that the Americans are going to be throwing nukes around. But basically, we'll, we'll sit back. We'll let the Russians, you know, launder a bit of money through our banks and so forth. But basically, no, we're not, we're not going to sell you anything. If we sell you artillery shells, we'll actually basically pretend that they are built in North Korea and the North Korean selling. If Russia wins, which is unlikely, but it's possible, then let's be honest, the West is going to get once again mired in all kinds of recriminations and searching of their conscience and whatever else. It's, they're going to be divided. They're going to be useless. On the other hand, if Russia loses, Russia will be all the more dependent on China, all the more finding itself probably you know, isolated, needing any kind of friend. And you know, a friend who is entirely self-interested will basically take fullest advantage of this. The Chinese are buying Russian oil and gas, but they're not doing the Russians any favours. I mean, they are basically gouging the best price that they can possibly get for it and such like. To follow your own metaphor, it's also that, in fact, Russia thinks China is a better friend than China thinks. Love it. Now, I don't want to just completely skip this, right? Because we've talked about Russia and why everything happened. But, I mean, Ukraine, the little engine that could you know, use an American metaphor, a rocky situation. I don't think we can completely discount that. Like Russia in World War II, as we were just talking about, they have this existential battle coming to them. And you have President Zelensky, who everyone's like, oh, the, the comedian, the actor, or something like that. I mean, did also Putin just completely underestimate Ukraine as a whole, including its leadership? Yeah, look, Putin, he, he said this, he, t he said it to, to, to George Bush, he's written it in essays and things. Essentially, he thinks Ukraine is just a kind of, you know, it's a sort of territory, part of which is really Russian, bits of it are really more Polish than anything else and such like. He honestly seems to have believed, and this I think is one of the key reasons why he invaded, because he was certain two weeks and it was all going to be over, because he just didn't think the Ukrainians would be willing to fight this not people for the, of this not country. You know, some people will be unhappy, but he could just impose a new leadership, one that was friendly to Moscow, and everyone would, would go along with it. So he absolutely, totally misread Ukraine. And again, this is something that someone, well, many people within the Russian system know much, much better. 
but no one had the guts to actually go up to him and challenge this view because he created this system in which, you know, that was not not good for your career, if not your health. So, yeah, he, he absolutely misunderstood the Ukrainians. But then again, look, in fairness, so did everyone else. I mean, there's the same sort of beltway DC defense analysts close to in, the sources of intelligence who were absolutely certain that Putin was going to invade were also the ones who were also saying, yeah, in two weeks, the Russians will have basically won. No one really sort of assessed the Ukrainians right. And look, in part, let's be honest, yeah, their secret weapon was Vladimir Putin and his particularly mor- moronic approach to the invasion. But beyond that, the irony of the fact that Putin claims that this is, or claimed at the time, that this was a war launched to try and bring about the denazification of Ukraine, not that Ukraine was in any way Nazi. Where in fact, if we're going to play the parallels, yeah, it's the Ukrainians are the equivalent of the Soviets defending their motherland against this you know, vicious, brutish invading army. Yeah, the, the, the Ukrainians are pretty much fully mobilized. They've demonstrated not just determination, but the capacity to outthink the Russians. That's you know very important. And they probably will continue to do so. I mean, I think this, this is going to be a very hot year. And I'm not sure the war is going to end this year. But I do think that the Ukrainians will be able to throw a lot more nasty surprises Putin's way. Now, a question I always ask the authors, the last one of the podcast, every episode, a lot of people think history is boring, Right. You say, you should read a history book. They say, I passed history in high school. I don't need to deal with that ever again. If I put one of those people who said history is boring in front of you, and they said, why should I read Putin's wars? What would you say? Well, I'd say it's that we have a tendency to think of history as something that's a long way away and doesn't really have any bearing on us. Actually, history is continuing to unfold all around us. And if nothing else, if that person pays taxes, well, there's billions of dollars, euros and pounds going to Ukraine every month. It might be interesting also and where it's going to go. Absolutely agree, Mark. It's a fantastic book. Thank you so much for coming on. My great pleasure. And that's it for this episode. Mark, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, everybody, reach out to us, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Let us know how we're doing. Let us know what you want more of. Suggest stuff to us. We're always up for it. Leave comments. Listen to the podcast episodes that you haven't to yet. And hey, if you can rate us, it really, really helps. So if there's a rating on your podcast app, please give us five stars. Until next time, nerds, stay cool. Stay cool.